Hello and welcome to Talk Mental Wellbeing in Times of Stress. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The COVID-19 virus seems set to impact our lives for the foreseeable future. And for most of us, it's changed already how we live and potentially how we feel. With economies ground to a halt, people we know and love becoming ill, the pressure on us shows no sign of decreasing. So how can we adjust and continue to adjust as the weeks go by? Professor Ian Robertson, neuroscientist and co-director of the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College Dublin, joins us to talk about what happens in our brains during times of mental pressure and how we can better cope during this time of collective stress. Thank you for joining us, Ian. Hello, Fenilla. We've all been getting used to washing our hands regularly and not touching our faces. How long does it take to make or break a habit? Well, something simple like hand washing, if you do it anywhere between 20 and 60 times to establish a habit, that then means you don't have to think about the behavior. So habits are relatively easy to establish. They can sometimes be difficult to break, particularly if they have some rewarding quality to them. Even though I've been washing my hands regularly and being diligent about not touching my face, I did find myself unconsciously doing that by using an uncovered hand to press an elevator button and then unconsciously touching my face. So despite or because I thought I had cultivated the habit, I clearly had forgotten it during a moment of unconscious behaviour. Absolutely. Touching your face is such a strongly formed habit. Most people touch their face many times a day. It's just a highly ingrained in our brain habit. And habits like that are quite difficult to break. And the great thing about habits is they allow us to do stuff without bothering the conscious, very limited capacity part of our brain that's our day-to-day consciousness. And so things can go below the radar, driving our car when we're listening to music, etc., But the trouble is, if we have habits that are causing us problems, like, for instance, risking giving ourselves the virus by touching our face, that then is something that needs us to pay attention. We need to really slow down and think about ordinary behaviours that before we took for granted. If I remember correctly, I'd looked in the mirror in the elevator and saw a speck of something on my face, which I then removed. And then the question became, had I infected myself? And it would have been very easy to panic can we choose to consciously not panic? Well, what we have to realise that any one event is statistically unlikely to be the event that gives you the virus. So it's important to keep the probabilities in your mind and not to panic. The upside of habits are that we are in control over our own destiny. We can, if we set our minds to it, establish new behaviours. We're all having to do this in this crisis suddenly our ways of life are completely changed. We can make it easier for ourselves if we just take the time to establish habits that are going to protect us, but also going to sustain us. So habits of exercise, for instance, habits of relaxation, habits of not always being in the same room as people you normally only see sometimes during the day. So there's a lot of behavioral habits that if we just take care to design them as if we were designing our way of life afresh, we can actually protect ourselves from some of the adverse consequences of this unusual situation we're in and maybe also give us some advantages of it, some upsides or positives of it. Do we as human beings have a tendency to gravitate towards bad habits rather than good habits? Well, the thing is that Bad habits are usually associated with taking the short-term easy way out that gives us a short-term reward. So our brains give preference to short-term rewards over longer-term rewards. So the good feeling you get having gone out for a walk, for instance, of taking exercise, that doesn't come on in the same way that a sip of whiskey or a glass of wine does, which affects directly the reward system of your brain. So we are constantly fighting a battle against the habits that um, switch on the reward networks of our brain, the feel-good network, often has to do with food or alcohol or drugs or cigarettes or sometimes even sex for some people. So it's much easier to establish bad habits in that sense than it is good habits. How can we talk ourselves up then to be able to better gravitate our behaviours towards that long-term reward system in the best of times, but particularly now in a time of great uncertainty and where there's danger to us and our loved ones? That's where it's important for us to become much more conscious of our day-to-day activities than we would normally be otherwise. Normally, we coast along on habits, on routines, 
Now, all these routines have been thrown in the air. So the risk is that rather than us carefully constructing like an architect a new set of routines for ourselves, we slip into a way of life where it's shaped by these bad habits, if you like, or these easy short-term activating the reward system habits, creating an artificial structure that may sound very, very daft at first. I still will go to work, even though that may mean walking 10 feet across the room. I'm still going to dress for work. I'm going to maintain a rhythm in life. I'm going to enjoy the company of the people I live with if I'm living with someone. Not all the time, because that's a challenge for everyone, but I will, as before, construct a period in the evening when we get together. Something that doesn't come easily to people to say, well, oh, if we're designing a way of life from scratch, how would we do it? And that's in a way what you have to do. And if you do that, Because you have the habits of the structure and the routines, it's less likely you'll end up just lounging on the sofa all day or eating bad food or drinking alcohol. These routines that you artificially create become a bit of a protector, a bit of an antidote to otherwise the tendency to slip into habits that are not good for us. So a bit of structure and discipline is called for. A final question, Ian, about self-isolation. Can taking measures to self-isolate help keep our fear at bay, even though we might be alone? And conversely, can fear spread among the public, even if we're not together? Fear is a very visceral kind of emotion. And if you see someone beside you who's frightened, it will much more readily activate your fight or flight system and make you frightened. So yes, it is contagious in that way. It's designed to be such. The whole point of fear is to be a warning signal to allow us to escape from danger, both for ourselves, but also for other people. So yes, being in isolation means that that kind of visceral route to the contagion of fear is not there. Nevertheless, we have this incredibly rapid information transmission route of social media, and it may not be quite as visceral but there is a way in which wrong information or alarming information can be spread very quickly. So it's very important that people don't just accept some tweet or some Facebook post that they see. It's very important that they say, hold on a minute, and have skepticism about everything, check the source, and give a pause to themselves. Don't just get sucked into whatever the alarming content of that message is, because a lot of the time that will be wrong and your fear will be unnecessary, harmful to you, but also if you pass it on, it'll be harmful to other people. Thank you, Ian. We hope you found some useful tips from Ian about staying positive during this time of collective stress. Ian Robertson is co-director of the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College Dublin, which along with GBHI at University of California, San Francisco, trains Atlantic Fellows for Equity in Brain Health. It's one of seven equity-focused Atlantic Fellows programmes around the world. For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to Talk Mental Wellbeing in Times of Stress.